Hey fellas, welcome back for another edition of our uh, virtual uh, men's group. Uh, I hope and I, I want you guys to know that, man, I miss meeting with you guys around the table so much. But uh, just here this Friday, today, and then our Christmas morning, I'll be putting out another video uh, Christmas morning. That'll be the, so, so this Friday and Christmas morning are going to be our last two virtual men's group. The first Friday in January, we're going to be able to try to get back together. So I hope you guys are looking forward to it as much as I am. Um, but until then, we still just want to kind of meet together. And, and last week, I was able to share with you guys a little bit about maybe what our greatest gift we could give to those around us, our family, our friends, those who really know us, those we love, and those who, who we really spend our time around. The greatest gift we could give them is a good godly legacy from a godly man. And that's why we meet every week, is we're just here every week to, to really sharpen each other up, to push each other in our faith, uh, to help each other stay on the right course, and to uh, live in such a way that brings God all the glory. We, we exist as the knight's table, guys that are, are godly men, to bring our king glory. We want to honor our king, and we do that. Each and every week we remind each other by living pure, speaking true, and righting wrongs. Not only in our own life, but righting some of the wrongs in this evil world we, we live in. God wants to use our lives uh, to change others. And so um, this week we get back with you again. And this week I want to kind of focus on something different. Last week was what gift could we give our family or those closest to us. And that was a, a great godly legacy we wanted to leave with them. But this week I want to pose the question, and I had a, a whole different lesson written for, for this morning, honestly. And then the other day I read an article from a decision magazine, uh, which is Billy Graham's Evangelistic Association, his magazine. And it was something posing the question that got me thinking, what is the greatest gift you could give to Jesus, the King who came, and the God who has everything. You know, sometimes the hardest gifts to buy are those for the people around us that we know they already have everything. What, what else could I get them? They already have it all. And it's really hard sometimes to choose for them. And to a God who, who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, a God who, if he were ever in need, he would not even ask us because he already has and can meet all of his own needs. What does God want from us? And this, this article I read really just posed that question and it, it suggested uh, one reading. And it was kind of a Bible study, more or less, that it kind of led you through. And I, it really got me thinking that day. And I want to just kind of share with you guys. It's uh, from John chapter 13. And this is Jesus you know, sitting down to eat the, the Passover meal with his disciples, knowing he's getting ready to go to the cross. He knows death is, is right around the corner. He knows the crucifixion is coming. And uh, when he sits down with them, his focus, his concern, his worry is not upon the death that he faces, not upon what he's about to do. And he knows he's about to lay down his life for others, which he says, no greater love is there than this, that, that somebody would lay down their life for a brother. And he's, he's ready to do that. But in this moment, he takes this opportunity to kind of let us in on maybe what the most important thing to him is. And it's probably the greatest gift we could give back to him uh, with our life here, and that is service to Him and towards others. Uh, loving Him and loving others by letting our life serve Him. And so that's really just what I want to talk to us about, is we want to kind of look at that John chapter 13 passage. It's uh, chapter 13, verse 1 through 11. If you want to kind of pause the, the video and even read that passage you can right now. And we'll, we'll just look at a couple things. But I think not only does he, he share with us what he would desire from us, but also how to do it. He even shows it to us as an example. And so what we see in there is, is Jesus 
being there with his disciples. And in that last moment, you know, John 13, 1, it says that Jesus knew his hour had come. He knew this was, this was about it. This was almost over. And he didn't have much time left with them. And so in that time left with him, instead of being concerned for himself, instead he concerns himself with teaching them what is most important out of their life, and that is to serve with the life that you've been given. And so he lovingly shows them what true love looks like. And what true love looks like is serving other people. And he wants us to get this message that he is going to show the full extent of his love when he goes to that cross. But even before then, he at that dinner demonstrates his love through serving them at the, the least level or the lowest level of the servant in the house. He, he assumes that position to show them that he loves them. And then um, he asks us to kind of do the same thing. And you look, the question then really becomes to us this, this week. And I want to just kind of ask this. And this week we won't do our accountability at the table. I'm going to kind of ask questions as we go. But as you read through that and you look at Jesus, I want us to answer this question. To what extent do we love Jesus or love others? And so this week... Every day in your life and with your life, do you truly show that you love Jesus and that you love others because you're willing to use your life to serve them? You look in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, and Paul shares with us. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, because of what God has done for you and the mercy that he showed you, I urge you. To present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is true worship. This is your true act of worship. Is that you serve Him with your life, your body. And so, I ask, uh, uh, this is Jesus getting ready to go to the cross to serve us with His body. But with those disciples, even in that moment, He took the the body that he lived in in flesh and he assumed the position of service to show them that he loved them at that moment. John 13, 34 and 35 says it this way. I give you a new command. And he says it's just later in the chapter. I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciple if you love one another, which shows just how important this is to him and what he thinks of this, that, hey, your goal then and your command that I'm leaving you with before I go. Now, later on, he'll give them a commission to go into all the world and share the gospel with their life. But right now, he's saying, I'm commanding you to do this also. To love one another. Serve each other in love. Um, John 17, 26, later on, it, it says, hey, when Jesus is praying for those same disciples and for us, He says, I made your name known to them. How did Jesus make God's name known to them? By serving them with His life. And then it says, and I will continue to make it known. Meaning, I'll continue to make it known when I go to the cross here shortly. I'll continue to make it known by living with them. But he says, so that the love you have loved me with may be in them and I may be in them. And so what God desires is that the same love that he showed to Jesus, Jesus is going to pour into us and love us with it but then it should live in us as well as he does, and we should love others with it. And so, one of the greatest things you can do this Christmas season and every day for the rest of your life, please give the king service. Let him use your life 
to love others, okay? That's one aspect that he shows us. The second aspect that he shows us is that we should serve um, willingly, okay? Willingly. Nobody asked him to do this. In John 13, 2 and 3, in that same chapter, it says... It states that Jesus knew that he had all authority in his hands. What that means is he's above everybody else. He could tell anybody else what to do or command it done, and it would get done. But in that process, he could have expected everybody to serve him. But he had even said it in his life before, that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And so he willingly came here to serve mankind. He willingly at this dinner gets up, puts the towel around his own waist, gets the basin, and starts going to each and every one of them's feet. Nobody made him do it. Nobody told him to do it. And he had limited time. He knew his time on this earth was running out, but he was still willing to just take that upon himself. Um, he knew that some, even while he was washing their feet, would kind of reject this. Peter says, don't wash my feet. Uh, you know, I'm not deserving of this. He knew that when he was washing Judas' feet, Judas was, was not, not only was he not going to reject him later, he was going to reject him later, but he wasn't deserving of his feet to be washed. This is a guy who's going to sell you out for 30 pieces of silver, yet you still wash his feet. He willingly does this just to prove that this is the kind of God God is. That nobody asked him, made him, begged him to do it. That before creation, he already, within his own heart, designed salvation. Because he's a God who willingly loves us before we even know our need. Are we the kind of people who willingly serve others? even when we're not asked to, even when we may be short on time, even when it may not be accepted very well, even when there's others who aren't deserving of it, will you willingly serve them? Because it honors your king and it shows his character. The third thing that we see in this is he offered service um, humbly. As I said, he's the one that... that Everybody else should have been serving. But he humbly takes the position of the lowest slave in the house. Kind of the, the job of the lowest slave in the house to wash the feet of those who come into the room. Luke 22 and 24 through 27, if we were to go over to Luke and read it, it shows that some of these disciples who are around the table at that moment, they've just been arguing about which one of them are going to have the positions uh, in the kingdom with him. Which one of us are going to be greater than the rest? Which one of us get to hold the position at his right hand and his left hand? And they're, they're bickering over this, which is something they've done more than once in Scripture. And Jesus then, kind of in response to that argument, just shows them. You want me to show you who's the greatest? It's the one who humbles themselves. John 13, 4 through 11, if you do read that, it says, you know, that Jesus then assumes the lowest servant's responsibility in the house. As I said earlier, no one asked him to do it. He just chose to. It wasn't glamorous. It wasn't prestigious. It's not the desirable position of a servant in that sense. But he wasn't too proud to do what needed to be done to let people know that they were loved, that this needs to be done, and somebody has to do it, and it should be me. And so I ask you, this is another question for this week. What service are you too proud to do? Ask this, what service do you maybe think is beneath you if God calls on you or if, if you see a need out there that needs to be done, but it's not glamorous, it's not desirable, it's not something that most people are willing to do or want to do, are you the one who's willing to humble yourself to the point that you'll do it because this is the kind of God 
I serve. He humbled himself. And Philippians chapter 2 lets us know that. That he humbled himself and he left his position to come here and robe himself in flesh and, and take the position of a servant to go die a miserable death to bring us back. Because it had to be done. Nobody else would have wanted to do it. Nobody else could do it. But the one who was in heaven in all glory, he shouldn't have. He, he rightfully could have stayed where he was, but he humbly took that place as a servant and served us and gave his life for us. So this Christmas, would you give your king any act of service? Would you do anything that Jesus asked you to do? in this life. He also shows us that his service that he rendered that day was obedient. He serves obediently. He does whatever the Father asked him to do to make sure that he was getting the point across to those disciples. And so whatever it took, he was willing to obediently follow God. Now, we never heard God tell him to do this in this passage. But there's another passage in the Bible that he says, I do nothing but what the Father tells me to do. Or I say nothing but only what the Father tells me to say. And so every single thing that Jesus was doing was in his heart, he was following the will of the Father. And so even though we verbally don't see that God says, hey, stand up from the table, go wash their feet and prove a point to them. We don't ever hear that. But within his heart, he knew that God wanted him to use that opportunity to teach them what their life was meant for and what God desires out of our life. And so he obediently got up, left his position, and went and did what had to be done. And so... With that said, that said I, I just ask you, and there's other verses in the Bible we could look at. You look, you look in the, the Bible here in 1 Corinthians 6, 20. It says that, that he, we've been bought at a price, that our bodies no longer are our own, actually, it says. And it says that we are to serve him with our body. You know, honor him with our body. That these bodies that we now live in are actually God's property and, and His Spirit lives in here with us. And we're supposed to use them just to obediently serve Him with our lives. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 says, Love of Jesus then. He, this is Paul saying that the love of Jesus compels him to do what, he has to, that he's, what he's doing. I'm asking you, does the love of Jesus compel you? to have to love others, to serve others. There's just something in me that now that God lives in me, there's something in my heart that just desires to, to love others, to show God's love towards others. It compels me to, to go after others with my life, to serve them so that they'll know how good God is. Um, it says that we should live for the one who died for us that we should live for the one who died for us. And so because he died and offered himself for us, now I should offer my life back to him in service. And so our service reflects his obedient attitude. And it says in, in Philippians 2, when we just talked about what, what it said about Jesus, right before that, that section of passage of Scripture between uh, Philippians 2, 5 through 11 there, uh, it right before that says the same attitude that was in Christ should be in you. And what was that attitude? Humble obedience. I will be obedient to whatever the Lord wills of my life. And so this Christmas, would you give the king service that follows his example but also obeys his command? So later on when he says there in verse 34 and 35, I give you a new command, love one another just as I have loved you. Which how did Jesus love us? He served us with his life. 
Do you and will you serve your king with your life? Will you be obedient in service? See, he also shows us that this is not something that is hard for Jesus. This is something that he willingly wants to do. It's something that it doesn't matter what job it is. He humbles himself. He stays obedient to the Father because he gladly serves his king, his father, his Lord. Jesus gladly serves the Father. And I ask you, do you gladly serve the Father? You know, if you look in Scripture, what opportunities, and I'll, I'll just ask you in your own life, what opportunities does the Lord give you? So here's another question this way. What opportunities does the Lord give you to serve Him? In your families, in your jobs, in your church, your small groups, in your neighborhood. What, what opportunities is God laying before you or giving you to serve Him? But then I ask you, are you accepting those opportunities gladly or with a, a glad heart that desires just to serve your God? that desires to, to show his love towards others. And so, do you gladly render up service to your king? Jesus says the result of our loving there, um, in chapter 13, verse 17, he says the result of that loving, willing, humble, obedient service to God will be a blessing for you. It's always this way with God. When He shows us the example first, when He just does it to us first, but then asks us just to follow His example, and He will already supply us with everything we need to do it. But He says, if you will do it, you will be blessed. There will be a blessing for you in it also. And so, here we go and we look in 2 Corinthians 4, uh, verse 1. Verse 7, verse 16 through 18. And if you read all those verses, it says that we are given a ministry. You know, one of the blessings, one of the gifts that we get from service is it will turn into a ministry for our lives. That it will give power to us. It will bring renewal to us. And he says it will bring eternal glory as gifts from serving. So the gifts you can get in your own life from serving is you'll be blessed, you'll be given a ministry, you'll have power, you'll have renewal, and you will have eternal glory just for serving Him, just for doing what He already did for you. And so I ask you this Christmas, just take some time to think about it, okay? And really think about what would Jesus desire from us? as a gift. And maybe he's already answered that in John 13. Maybe the answer is this. All he has ever wanted is relationship with you. And he came to, to bring that relationship back together. But in that relationship, he left you here as his representative. And what he really desires from your life is active service. Loving, humble, obedient, willing service to his kingship. He just wants you to represent him while you're here by loving others and serving them the way he served you. And so this Christmas, let's make sure, I know it's a different Christmas. I know things are not normal or, and it may be totally different than ever. But maybe, just maybe, it could be better than any other Christmas ever. Because maybe for the first time, you might just really get the fact that not only am I going to celebrate the King who came, and I'm going to use Christmas to celebrate Him and His coming and what He did for us, but I'm going to get it. And I'm going to figure out what this is really all about. He came here to, to display God's love to us by serving us with his life and by laying down his life for us. And as long as I'm left here until I get to go back home, what he asks of us 
to give back to him as a gift is for us to love him by loving others and serving others the way he served us. So, guys, listen, I'm going to meet back with you next Friday. It's Christmas morning. We're just going to share something I don't even know yet, but we'll spend some time in God's Word just really just thinking about what Christmas morning means to us. And uh, so meet me next next Friday online. We'll have that last one for the year, and we'll celebrate Christmas together next Friday. But then we're going to get back together in January. We'll be back in the building, back at the table with each other. And as, shine, as iron sharpens iron, so one of us will sharpen another. And that's the way things are going to be, okay? And so uh, be truly willing to serve with uh, all your heart this year. And this season, make sure that you really just offer back to him what he really desires. And that's for the rest of your life. Let's just love others in service the way he loves. All right, I'll see you next week. Thanks for spending your time with me.